This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 4th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, to provide context, we add some of the other things that should be considered when discussing the impact that oil has on the Alaska economy. Second, we discuss what's missing from yet another legislative op-ed pushing for increased K-12 spending. And third, we discuss whether Conoco's Willow Project is facing a breaking point. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into this. I mean, we got uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover this morning. And today we're going to uh, we're going to start uh, now. First and foremost is um, how the oil companies continue to and the oil industry as a whole continue to tout the fact that they are a huge part of the economy. Right. I mean, we know that. But they you know, every couple of years they throw a study together that says, well, look at how look at how much we contribute. Please treat us nicely is what the what kind of the feeling is of it. But you say that's just uh Part of the picture for number one of the weekly top three. Hit, hit us with it. Here. Right. So last week was uh, the the meeting, or late last week was the meeting of the Alaska annual meeting of the Alaska Oil and Gas Association, and uh, there was a lot of uh, of, of, of major attendees: uh, Senator Sullivan, uh, former uh, governor, uh, Texas governor, former Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, um, and others uh, came and uh, and celebrated with them. And in part, and, and as part of it, they released a new study. A eh, released a new study that showed how important uh, the oil and gas industry to is to uh, is to Alaska. The headline uh, written by on the Alaska Beacon by Yareth Rosen is: "Oil and gas companies have outsized economic impact on Alaska," says industry study, and they do. It, the industry affects Alaska in two different, primarily in two different ways. One is through the revenue flow, uh, the state's portion of the revenue flow from oil. And that stays fairly consistent, you know, declining volumes. But but it doesn't it doesn't bounce up and down a lot over time. It's sort of that's sort that's sort of always there. Then the, then there's an added piece of it when the oil industry is in construction mode, uh, as they were with Point Thompson in the early 20 teens, as they are now with Willow, with with uh, ConocoPhillips's Willow project and with uh, uh, Oil Search's PICA project, uh, they're in construction mode. And what construction mode really does for the industry or does for Alaska is it spikes the number of contracts, contractor activity up on the slope. Well, elsewhere, as they, as they build modules and pieces for uh, that part, that the slope activity, the, the construction on the slope, and then the number of employees bounce up because you have all those people involved in construction. And, and we're going into construction mode now. So it's a great time for the industry to do a study like this because you've got both the, the hit of the oil revenues and the hit of construction mode uh, to, to factor into the equation and show how important you are to Alaska. But there's, there's two things that, as I read this and I read the study, there's two things that, that hit me um, that I think we... we we, we need to balance this, this importance of the oil industry with. One is the PFD has, has a similar economic impact. Now, it doesn't have the spike impact when you add in construction on top, uh, on top of, the, of the revenue flow. Right. But the P, PFD is similarly important 
to the overall Alaska economy. Yet we never see, you know, headlines that say permanent fund dividend has outsized impact, economic impact on Alaska. Uh, that's because it's because those in the legislature want to use want to cut use PFD cuts as a way of funding uh, government growth, and and they don't want people to understand. I don't think they don't want people to understand the the outsized impact that the PFD has. So. Every time I read a story about how important the oil industry is to, to Alaska, I want to see a similar story that says how important the PFD is to Alaska, but you just don't see it. And, and the reason is politics. It's not, it's not because the economics are that vastly different. It's not because the impact is that vastly different. It's because of politics that people want to use PFD cuts for their own, you know, the, 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 the 21 plus 11 in the, in the Senate, in the House and the Senate plus the governor want to use PFD, the PFD for themselves as opposed to sharing it with Alaska families. And that is uh, that that always irritates me when you see something about how important the oil and gas companies are. Well, there's something else that's similarly important. And, and we 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 ignore that. The second thing is, yes, the oil and gas industry is important to Alaska. But headlines like this and studies like this are designed to make you think, well, Gosh, we can't do anything to upset it because it's so important to Alaska. We can't, we can't look at additional taxes on it. We can't look at additional ways to, to deal with it because it's so important to Alaska. And that's not true. Right. I mean, it's there. There are. <laughs> we 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 have a constitutional mandate. The legislature and the governor has a constitutional mandate to optimize to maximize the revenue flow from the state's resources for the benefit of Alaskans, not for the private benefit of companies, for the benefit of Alaskans. And the, and the way you, one should look at that, I think, is to look at, you know, look at the long term, look at the short, medium and long term and say, look, can we get more revenue without, you know, if you can tax the revenue to the point where you can tax the industry to the point where the industry stops investing and then the decline curve goes like that. And you end up with less revenues. You end up with more per unit revenues because of the tax, but you end up with less overall revenues because of the decline curve you put yourself into. But there is a sweet spot where you can where you can tax up to and and even if the decline curve shifts a little down because you're getting more per unit, you end up with more revenue. We right. did a call we did a column on that once in the Alaska landmine if if uh, if people want to understand the concept better better. But 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 you you need to always be searching for that for that sweet spot. I mean, Britain does it. Britain changes taxes, frankly, about every year uh, on the oil industry as they're constantly in search of of that sweet spot. Uh, we get locked in. We Alaska get locked in and say, well, this is this is the right uh, uh, revenue structure. This is the right split at the time. And in 2013, we hit that right. I think we hit that right revenue structure. We hit that right revenue. We, this is the right revenue structure at the time. And then, oh, we need to lock that away and 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 go on and never touch that again because it's so important industry. Well, it, things change. I mean, industry costs change, uh, uh, volumes change, all sorts of things change. And and you can you can you, you should constantly be re looking at at the revenue split. Given the constitutional mandate to maximize revenue for the benefit of Alaskans, you should constantly be looking at that revenue split. And what happens is we get is we get, you know, headlines like this and studies like this and people go, well, we can't touch the oil industry. We need the investment. Well, you know, you, you could get more investment if you drop taxes and if you eliminated taxes, you get a lot of investment. But that's not what that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says, you know, maximize the revenue for for current and, and future future Alaskans. Right. And, and and studies like this always irritate me because they don't they don't have that balance in them. They don't talk about yeah, it, no one. I mean the politicians on the stage certainly didn't talk about. It. Yes, this is great. But are we getting are we fulfilling our constitutional duty to maximize the revenue for the benefit of Alaskans? Right. And this is not just you as a I mean again you're an oil and gas guy and so you understand this stuff. This is the industry you came out of. And you're advocating that there are solutions. I mean, whether it's the Hill Corp loophole or others, uh, I think between our discussions, you and I have talked about, I mean, there's four or five hundred million dollars that could still be on the table there. And that's a significant chunk. You talk about five hundred, half a billion dollars that could be on the table year after year um, that are is going to the oil companies that could come to us again to maximize that benefit as per the Constitution. 
Uh, and that's what these 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 studies always come out. And we understand that there's an oversized impact on the economy, but it always comes out as look at us, please don't hurt us because we don't, please don't change anything because look at how much we are a part of, you know, kind of thing. You know, I guess that's the cost of doing business, but there are opportunities for us to, this is a finite resource. We have to capture as much as we can as owners. That just makes sense. And if it has to change every three or four years, again, that's just the cost of doing business. Yeah. And, and, and you don't want to kill the golden goose. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to tax them to the point that, that they stop investment or significantly reduce investment. So you lose money in the long term by trying to grab more in the short term, you lose money in the long term. But, but if there are, if there are opportunities to increase take uh, uh, government take without killing the golden goose by, by maybe affecting the decline curve a little bit, but not, but not so much that you're losing money long term. If there are, are opportunities for that, you should, I mean, the legislature and the governor have a constitutional mandate to do that. You could almost say, I would almost say they have a fiduciary obligation uh, to do that, uh, to look for those, to look for those opportunities. And, and I just don't think we are. I mean, the governor, the Department of Revenue, what, two years ago in the 2022 uh, fiscal model included um, uh, both closing the effects of closing the, 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 the Hill Corp loophole and the effect of increasing the tax rates by reducing the per barrel credit by $3. Um, and and factored that through and didn't show any impact on volumes. So it was increased revenue, about 500 million, uh, but no decrease in volumes uh, in, in, in what they showed in the fiscal model. Now, interestingly enough, under Adam Crum, you can't find that in the, in the FY23 fiscal, in the 2023 fiscal model. They took out all of those, they took out all of the revenue factors. So you can't determine that from the, uh, from the 2023 fiscal model. But fortunately enough, I, I downloaded the 2022 fiscal model so I can, <laughs> I can still find it and still do the calculations. And they showed right. that there wasn't any, there wasn't any impact. Now, maybe, maybe there is, and maybe, you know, maybe we need to, we need to find out what that is, calculate what that is, but I don't see the, the, the effort from the administration or the effort from the legislature, to be honest, uh, to go in and do the work that's necessary to, 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 to maximize, maximize the revenue. I will say one other thing. Part of the problem is that when we get into this subject, people go, oh, just repeal SB 21, like Joe Pascovan a few weeks ago. Oh, just repeal SB 21 and, and go, back to, to go back to where we were. Well, that's wrong, too. I mean, you, you can overreach. You can kill the golden goose. This, you, need to, you need to go at this stuff with a scalpel as opposed to a blunt edge instrument. Uh, and and just you know say oh a, a billion a billion two million or two hundred million that's that's what we no I mean that's that's wrong too I mean that kills the golden goose that sets us on a on a on a reduced investment and on a decline curve that uh, that goes in here I it, it is frustrating to me it is frustrating to me that we don't see legislators going in uh, you know legislators Republican legislators who talk about oh we have the Constitution, this, the Constitution, that, the Constitution requires we do this. Who, 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 but who forget the part of the Constitution that says, go, right. you know, go maximize oil revenues um, and reduce the burden, re reduce the burden on Alaskans. That's that's part of your responsibility. And yeah. it's just frustrating when we see, you know, them become cheerleaders like they were at the AOGA meeting, become cheerleaders for the industry instead of cheerleaders for Alaska. I mean, which side are you on? Um, <laughs> Wait, don't ask that question. Don't ask that question for sure. We just finished up with number one. Number two is the continual cry from peoples, including legislators, about how we are just bad people for not spending enough on education. This article, there's so many problems in this article. I want to talk about it. It's from Rebecca Hemshoot. Uh, Brad, give us uh, give us your details on it here. Well, it's an op-ed that's in the uh, the ADN uh, headline is Alaska schools are at the center of our communities and they're drastically underfunded. Uh, it is by uh, Representative Rebecca Hemshoot, who herself is a teacher. Uh, she took uh, JKT's uh, Jonathan Christ Tompkins place uh, in the legislature from uh, from Southeast. And it's one long paragraph. I mean, this must be 800 words, maybe. One long uh, screed about uh, we need more money in schools and how you know not doing that is failing children, failing families, failing Alaska, failing just you know failing everything. 
but here's the thing that's not in it. And, and it's the, and it's the thing I always look for, you know, I, I, I go through these article, I go through these op-eds and I go, okay, representative, somebody who at least understands who's supposed to understand responsibility. Right. And, and they're going to tell me how much they're going to tell me why we need to spend. And then they're going to tell me at the end, this is the, my fantasy world I live in. And then they're going to tell me in the end who pays, who's going to pay for all this additional money that, uh, that they want. Not a word, not one word in the entire screed about, about who pays. It's just, we need more, we need more, we need more, we need more, and, and, and we need more. <laughs> and, and by the way, we need more. And it's, and, and nothing about where, where this money is supposed to magically come from. And so in the silence, we know what that means, right? It means it comes from middle and lower income Alaska families. So right. through through PFD cuts. So here here's here's what here's the message that really comes through from pieces like this. We need to spend more because Alaska families are in peril, Alaska kids are in peril, Alaska communities are in peril. We need to spend more, but we don't need to charge. But but we don't need to charge everybody for it. We just need to take money from those least able to afford it, middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, and let the top twenty percent non residents ride free. That's the message that comes through from this. And frankly, you know, that gets, that just, that, that blows the message away from me. You know, if somebody tells me they need more, fine. Okay. Explain why you need more, but then tell me who's going to pay for it and at least be fair and say, you know, that everybody's going to contribute something toward it and a fairly even amount or a fairly equitable amount toward it. And then I'll listen. But when you just tell me we need to spend more, we need to spend more, we need to spend more, and you don't address the elephant in the room, frankly, which is who's going to pay for all this additional spending, it just it it it, it wipes away the message for me. I mean, I just don't. I, it, it's hard to listen to it because they they're not taking the responsibility to step up and say, and this is who who's going to pay for it. So when you're left with your left when you're left with the impression that oh. Everybody needs to benefit. Everybody will benefit. Sort of like childcare, right? The top hundred, those earning a hundred thousand and more, they need childcare too. Everybody will benefit, but we only want we, we, we want to do it in a way that only middle and lower income Alaska families pay for it. It's just it loses the message. And this is this is yet another example of that sort of approach out of legislators. These are leg, this is a this is a legislator who, by the way. Um, uh, refused to support uh, Ben Carpenter's sales tax, which, while not perfect, nevertheless is a heck of a lot more equitable than PFD cuts. Refused to support Ben Carpenter's sales tax, and when push came to shove, when the budget came to the vote, last legislature voted to fund with PFD cuts. Voted to fund on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. So you know, <laughs> yeah, tell me, tell me how progressive you are. Tell me how. You know how enlightened you are. Tell me how you know needful everything is. Tell me how you really got to work hard for Alaska families to to you know make this make these additional spendings. Uh, tell me all that, but but your votes are telling me you don't believe that everybody contributes equally to these things. You you believe that that, that the cost ought to be shoved off on middle and lower income Alaska families, and I just you, you lose me at that point. Right. Well, it's, it's always some interesting things uh, in this. You know, it's always some half truths and innuendos wrapped up in here. Uh, partway through, she says, what's more, Alaskan educators don't receive a pension or Social Security. Well, they don't receive Social Security, but they do have the TERS system, which is the teacher's retirement system. They do have a uh, they do have a retirement, but whether it's a and, and I think what she's saying there is there's no defined benefits pension. It's a self-directed thing at tier four. Not all of them are tier four, obviously, but it's like these half truths that go through there and, and talk about this. And then later on, she goes and talks about the cost of Alaska spending, how it's more than than many states. But you got to adjust. And once you adjust, we spend less uh, than the average, uh, the national average. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> We are spending more even in some of the main cities than they're spending in other states. This is not just a rural Alaskan problem. Yeah. Yeah. The, the defined contribution, defined benefit argument is always sort of humorous. I I mean, during my career, I had defined contribution, right? I mean, I set money away as I as I went along uh, 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 into a 401k or uh, to, to 
you know, prepare for retirement to have a, to have what I needed in retirement. I, you know, I survived somehow. Uh, other people, I mean, all of my cohorts through my career had 401ks uh, as well uh, in the law firms and that's, and the, they survived. Um, so it, it always, I mean, what they're really, what, what, what the argument really is, I don't want to, they're saying, I don't want the risk of my retirement. I want, I want the state to guarantee my retirement uh, through a defined benefits program, that I will have a certain benefit and the state will guarantee that even if the stock market, even if the investment market doesn't produce, uh, doesn't justify that return. I want that guaranteed uh, as opposed to, you know, I'm a big boy. I can, I can take the risk. I can assume I can, I can make investments as well as the next guy. I can go you know, use some investment advisor or I can go, you know, pool my money into a, a, a fund uh, and invest that way. I mean, that's what this is all about. They want they want government to guarantee those who argue for defined benefits want government to guarantee the outcome. They're not willing to take the risk themselves. And I. Yeah, OK, <laughs> um, I, I, I you know, there are people out there who did fine with defined contribution and and, and I and. I can't I can't get a whole lot of concern for people who want government to guarantee the outcome of out, the outcome of their uh, of their retirement, regardless of, of what the investment returns are. Right. Well, no, it is frustrating for those of us who've had to make our own way and do our own thing with retirements over the years. Uh, I mean, it'd be nice if everybody got handed that that whole defined benefits thing. But again, the costs, as we've seen across the nation, have been excruciating. I mean, it is, you know, it's caused many companies to teeter on the edge of bankruptcy. They've had to be bailed out by the federal government. We've seen it time and time and time again. It's not a viable option, but they continue to sneak it in, in every discussion. I mean, this is a discussion about school spending, but there's your jab for, uh, for defined benefits that that's going to, that's going to cause it. And, and of course we know through some of the studies that it's not necessarily, um, it's not the, it's not the retirement and the benefits for these teachers to entice them there. That's not what's tripping them over. Um, I mean, we need the governor's plan, which was submarine, would have uh, created some, you know, some bonuses and some other things, but they didn't want that. She pays lip service to it, but the, basically the bill went nowhere. So there are options to do things like that out there, but they don't, they don't really push for it when there is an option in front of them. It's all yep. or nothing, it seems like. It seems like it's all or nothing. That could be something that would be incremental. And yet she says, oh, that's great, but never supports it. Yeah, it's... Um, uh, it, it... It's it's you know govern, give me give me a higher salary now, guarantee my retirement through a defined benefits program, you know immunize me essentially against you know the market that's affecting everybody else. Have government you know uh, guarantee the outcome as opposed to as opposed to riding the market like everybody else who's had on defined contributions, um, and and you know and pay me more pay me more now, but but but. But don't don't say who should be supplying all this additional money. Don't 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 try to be equitable. You know, you want to be equitable to the teachers. You want to be equitable pay. You want defined benefits. You want to be equitable retirement. But you don't want to be equitable on the incoming side. You don't want to be you're not you're not advocate advocating being equitable on the revenue side, how we're going to pay for this. And it's just uh, it's just very frustrating. It's very one sided. If legislators, I mean, good legislators are balanced, like Ben, like Carpenter. I mean, Carpenter says, you know, yes, we're, we're going to spend. I recognize we're going to spend. We need to balance that with with revenue flow. We need to we need to recognize that there needs to be revenue flow to support that to support that spending, as opposed to just taking it out of through taking it out through PFD taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. We've got then, uh, so that's that's responsible. I mean, that's that's covering both sides of it. But then we got the legislators like Rebecca here who says, spend, 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 you know, spend more, do more, government guarantee more, but without addressing the revenue flow, just assuming that, you know, we'll just take it more out of PFD cuts to, to, to cover the cost. And that's that's not balanced. I mean, that's just that's very one sided. She's, she's more in this piece. She's more a lobbyist, uh, more. Uh, 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 an industry booster than she is a state rep, a state representative, a state legislator, or somebody who's trying to balance both sides. So if a government guarantees a thing 
if government, if a government guarantee is a thing, why not go into the social security system? Yeah. I don't know the justification for removing teachers from social security back in the day. Um, I just know that they do not participate in that system. And I think that was part of the trade-off with the Pers and Ter system. Uh, maybe it's time to ask them to, you know, for them to go back into the social security system. Uh, I mean, that just seems like that makes sense, Brad. I think there's a problem with that, Michael. I looked at that at one point. I didn't. I didn't exhaustively look at it, but I looked at it enough to, to figure out that 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 the government, the federal government, won't let you do that. I mean, you have to have contributed to it. The whole system is based on contribution over life, right? You know, benefits are based on contribution over life. You can't just sort of halfway through say, "Oh, by the way, I want back in, opt back in." And there was there's some significant issue, uh, as I as I came to understand it about getting back into the social security system. It might be, it, it would be difficult. It uh, might be hugely costly in terms of catch up payments. Um, so it's, um, it's not as easy as say, as saying, okay, well, we opt out of, of the state retirement system. We want to go back to social security. You just, you can't, you can't flip like that. As individuals, I mean, if somebody quit the state, quit working for the te- as a teacher and went and got a job somewhere else, pushing brooms or something, uh, I mean, they would be back in the Social Security system, but you're saying the system as a whole would have a hard time getting back into the Social Security system. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Now, I, again, I haven't, I, I've never really researched this. What was the justification originally? Was it, did it have to do with the pensions, like the size of the pension, or what was it? No, there was a choice. Is, 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 again, I, I didn't research this exhaustively, but, but my appreciation of it was that there was a, a decision point at which you could either stay in Social Security or opt out of Social Security. And the state to to avoid the employer share of the contribution to Social Security. Remember, Social Security has both an employee and an employer contribution. Uh, to avoid the employer share of the contribution, the state decided to set up its own uh, retirement system, and so saved money from uh, from not contributing not not contributing the employer share to Social Security. And and had its own uh, had its own retirement system. So it was there was a decision made. I can't recall. Yeah, I can't recall even the time frame. But there but there came a time at which you had to make it at which states had the opportunity to opt in or opt out. And Alaska was one of the one of the few actually, but one of the opt out states. Well, interesting. Uh, you know, again, that's a choice. You know, make you know going into that when you go to work. That's uh, something that you uh, uh, that you know uh, that goes on. Um, I just got a message here. Every school district chooses whether or not to join Social Security. Both the district and the employees would contribute to that uh, as well. Um, all right. Um, let's see. We just finished up with that. We're going to go talk about, I, I guess, I just posted this article back up in the chat room. If you guys want to read this from uh, Rebecca Hemshoot. Again, this whole thing just feels more like a, um, I, this is what, this is what gets me. Uh, she goes on to talk in this article about how, you know, schools provide community gyms and tsunami shelters and there's spaces for the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and the Big Sisters and the, uh, the you know, meeting their meeting places. And and and, and I, I love how she's tagging all this together with what is constitutionally required, which is education for children, uh, and then ties it all into, well, now the state should provide all these community buildings and shelters. And it, I mean, there are other options, again, tying this all together, like it's all part of the same mandate. Um, you know, it is, again, never a question of who pays for it. It is just how can we get more stuff, uh, essentially, <laughs> in the in the end? Yeah, we need more and more and more of it. But but yeah, don't worry about who pays for it. I mean, don't worry about the impact. I mean, the same families that she's talking about that needs all the need all these things. She wants to take the money out of their pockets increasingly out of the, I mean, because it's a regressive tax, increasingly out of lower, the lower your, your income goes, the more as a percent you pay all these people she wants to protect. She's, she's, she's the, the counterbalance is she's taking money out of their pockets to do it. She's not spreading the burden broadly across all Alaska families, non-residents, uh, a little bit, some additional, a little bit from the old company. She's just concentrating by by omission, by not talking about uh, about who pays, leaving it leaving the, the 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 funding to come from additional PFD cuts. So she's she's taking money 
out of the very out of the hands of the very people, mo the most money out of the very hands of the people that she claims to be protecting. Right. And, 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 and that's and, a and, constant, that's a constant argument, right? I mean, and, and, and so, and so you wonder, is she protecting them or is she protecting something else? She's not really protecting the people because she's taking the money out of their pockets to, to right. pay for this stuff. So, well, and that's again, that's a continuing argument from from pretty much everybody who's the big, bigger pro government side is, well, you know, we got to protect these people by taking their PFD and spending it for them, which again is just another hint of the whole idea of we know better than you kind of thing that's uh, that we've seen uh, out there. The weekly top three continues. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, I know it's a heck of a way to start a week, but that's uh, that's why we're going on here. Uh, the next one is a little bit of a surprise for many people who've been following this. This is the discussion on the Willow decision. That, uh, that uh, uh, environmental statement and all the federal work that was done is now up in front of uh, Superior Court Judge Sharon Gleason, and there it's being uh, asked by several environmental groups to overturn it. Uh, overturn this is the second time it's been sent back to the drawing board. Uh, the first time they got sent back to the drawing board and then they came back and now this is the second time. But uh, Conoco made an announcement here recently that surprised a lot of people, Brad. Conoco has been fairly consistent throughout the entire Willow battle of saying of, of being very patient and saying, look, Willow is a big project. It has a lot of a lot of moving parts, but it's a big reward. There's a lot of oil out there. Uh, we want the opportunity to go get that oil. We think we can do it economically. We think we can make money out of it. And we're going to keep the Willow project going. And, and most of the quarterly conferences they've had with, well, all of the quarterly conferences they've had with, with an investment analysts where they've discussed Willow, that's sort of been the, the storyline. We're patient. We're going to wait through this. We know how to manage these projects. This risk is part of the this environmental stuff is part of the risk you have when you go into Alaska. We've been in Alaska a long time. We know how to handle this stuff. We're going to work through it. In the latest court filing, in the latest set of court filings with Judge Gleason, though, they're changing their tune a little bit. Um, and here, this is an article by James Brooks in the Alaska Beacon again. The headline is Conoco Phillips says court case is likely do or die for a Willow Arctic oil project. And here's the first two paragraphs. In documents filed this week in Anchorage, international oil company ConocoPhillips said an ongoing federal court case is likely to make or break Alaska's largest plan oil development in decades. If Alaska District Court Judge Sharon Gleason cancels required federal approvals, quote, the Willow Project is highly unlikely to proceed at all, close quote, said Connor Dunn, vice president of Willow for ConocoPhillips. That's the first time that Conoco's ever said uh, the project is at risk. They've all the times before it's been we can manage this. We know what we're doing. Uh, it's part of Alaska. We we handle Alaska. We got we got it all done. Now they're telling the court the Willow project is highly unlikely to proceed at all. And part of this part of this is is the time frame that we're dealing with um, the. Willow is being developed on federal leases. Federal leases have a term and, and you extend the term by having production, first production by a certain date. If you don't have first production by a certain date, then the lease expires. Uh, you have to say, take several steps along the way, but first production is one of those steps. And, and if you achieve first production, then the, then the, lease, the lease term is extended for as long as, as commercial production is achieved from the lease. But, but we're nearing uh, that date and essentially what ConocoPhillips is arguing is if we don't get these approvals, if, if Judge Gleason sends these approvals back uh, for further work by the administration, then uh, we're not going to have the approvals in hand in time to, to complete the construction and get first production under underway by the time that we that we hit the, the lease term. Now, in most instances, if you're making good faith, I mean, I've dealt with these issues a lot, a lot in my career. In most instances, if you're dealing in good faith as you come up on the with government, federal government in particular, as you come up on the end of the of the lease term, if there are things that have happened that aren't your fault, and and you are dealing in good faith and trying to achieve that, the government will extend the lease term. 
I mean, it's not, it's not that, it's not that lease terms can't be modified. They can be modified by the government and they are, they have been in a, a number of instances, a huge number of instances over the years across the country as you, as you come up on the end, because the government doesn't want to lose the, they don't want to lose the productive value of that lease. They don't want to terminate the lease and either have to start the process all over again uh, and, and have a significant delay or just lose the prospect entirely. The government wants the revenue from the lease as badly as anybody else. So they will extend the lease term. If it looks like you're going to make it, you're just not going to make it by a certain date. But what Conoco said, is, what Conoco is saying is they're concerned. They're talking about terminating this because they're concerned that if the approvals aren't, aren't achieved, then they're not going to have first production by the, by the lease date. And essentially what they're saying is, and, 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 you know, maybe with good reason that they don't trust whatever administration is in place at the time uh, to extend the lease term uh, 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 when, if they, if they come up to the end of that lease term and they don't, and they haven't achieved uh, first production by that date. More likely a, a, a second reading of this is they're just frustrated, you know, that they, they jumped through all the hoops during the Trump administration. They got approvals. Then the Biden administration came in and the Biden administration said, no, that we got to go back and we got to redo certain stuff. Uh, and we got to get us, we got to get another set, set of approvals. And now we've gotten that second set of approvals. And now, now people are appealing that. Uh, and Conoco is just saying, look, you know, if we're, if we're not going to get approval for what the Biden administration did, did uh, uh, the Biden administration said, let's keep on going. The Biden administration looked at it uh, and the Biden administration gave these gave these approvals with these conditions. If we're not going to get approval, given what the Biden administration did, we're never going to get approval uh, on uh, on 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 this sort of this sort of project. And so we're just going to just we're going to give up on it. Um both those things are contributing to, to, to Conoco's position, but it's just a surprising position. It's just a surprising change, I think, in the position, <coughs> as I and others perceive it, a change in their position that they've had all along of, you know, we can handle these things. We're fine. Just be patient. We'll get there. Don't worry about it. What they've told investors. And now the all of a sudden, highly unlikely to proceed at all if they don't get these get these approvals uh, approved by Judge Gleason. It's and, a concern. Yeah, it is a concern. Willow is the cornerstone of future production uh, here in the state. It's been held up as this is going to be the next phase of uh, of production on the North Slope, and, and this is what we need. Um, what What's your take on this? I mean, you followed what Gleason did in 2020 when she reversed um, the previous, that was the Trump administration's approval. Uh, everybody was a bit surprised when the uh, when the Biden administration uh, passed it through and gave their approval as well after a period of time. Um, what's your take on this? Do you have a feel for where Gleason may go on this, or what? What's your thoughts? I think I think the the likelihood is that Gleason approves um, uh, the the leases or the conditions that that have been imposed on the leases. Uh, the Biden administration. Uh, did a more thorough job than the Trump administration did. Admittedly, the Trump administration sort of tried to grease it through. <coughs> excuse me, tried to grease it through with a uh, with a, a minimal number of of limitations. The Biden administration has been much more thorough. They've taken into account a lot of a, a number of additional things. I think there's enough there for Judge Gleason to approve it, and I think this becomes you know becomes an interesting statement that Conoco made along the way, but but not one that 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 becomes effective, but you know, you never can tell judges are judges are interesting people. Um, they sometimes find legal issues that, uh, find issues fascinating that others don't. Uh, they sometimes, uh, you know, you want to hold the government to account to do everything that the government's supposed to do. Uh, judge Leeson has been a very thorough judge. She's been a, a very, uh, 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 fair judge. I think, uh, some don't. Some think she's biased, but I think she's been a fair, very fair judge, and I and I think that uh, I think that approval here is highly likely. But you know, it 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 may not. She may she may send it back, and and Conoco's warning uh, is something something to take seriously. You don't you don't make these comments in court filings lightly, uh, because you know investors and others see them and uh, and react to them, and you don't make, you don't want to mislead a court because that'll come back to bite you. 
you don't want to threaten a court. Uh, and this sort of comes across in a way as a threat. So it's it, it's just a very interesting uh, it's just a very interesting statement and uh, one that I think is certainly a, a, important for for us to consider and us to keep in mind as we as we follow along uh, uh, the progress of the case. Judge Gleason has said that she'll rule by November. She set up a schedule that will put her in a position to rule by November um, in order to let Conoco proceed with the winter construction uh, to, to gear up and do the winter construction uh, if she approves the uh, if she approves the permit. So we're, we're going to know sooner rather than later. This is not one of those that's going to drag out for a long period of time. And it's not one that Conoco said, you know, if we lose this on appeal, <laughs> if Judge Gleason rules, rules against this and we lose it on appeal, then we're going to consider undoing. I mean, they're saying basically that, uh, that the district court judge is going to decide whether this project goes forward. So, right. Uh, what, it's it, it's a big issue. What does this What does this say to future production? I mean, let's just say theoretically the the judge comes back and and denies it. Um, what 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 does this say to Alaskan production in the future? Well, it says at least on federal lands, uh, boys, you're going to have a boys and, and women, you're going to have a hard time going forward uh, on federal lands. Uh, NPR. Er, uh, uh, Anwar is already dead, but it's going to say Anwar, Anwar, you're dead again. Uh, NPR, NPRA, uh, you're just going to have a hard time going forward. And any additional, any other federal lands, NPRA is the big one. But you know, if somebody has a discovery in the offshore waters that affects you know federal waters, uh, then then it'll affect that. It's going to say on federal lands, you're 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 sort of wasting your time. You won't right. say that. Won't say that about state lands. Won't say that about the Pika project. But on federal lands, it'll say you're sort of wasting your time anymore. You know what struck me most about this, uh, Brad, was I hadn't realized uh, until I was going back and doing the, some reading on this and looking at it and realized this lease again is a thirty-year. I mean, here we are. It's a thirty-year lease. And we're just coming down to the wire here on 30 years to try and get this project off the ground. Um, I mean, the, the time frames on these things are so, the, the details on them are so long. Uh, I mean, if you get started now, it's another 30 years. I mean, if that's the case, if that's the way that it works, if you had to just start from scratch again, uh, yeah, what company is going to look at that and then look at the money? They spent nine hundred and something million dollars in the last year or so alone, and they're expected to spend more in the coming year. But I mean, how much money has been poured into this hole that uh, if it goes sideways, thirty years? I mean, I, the 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 length of these things is what blows my mind. Well, this project hasn't been in development for thirty years. I mean, what what you do with leases, what companies do with leases, is is they sort of identify a region that they're interested in. And there's no reason to spend money in that area unless you got leases, land, land access. So, so you you sort of stockpile the leases, and then you sort of sort through over time. You sort through those with the best objective. You, you stockpile the leases at the time the leases come up for sale because you don't want somebody else to buy the lease. If you think this area might be productive, uh, you you go and get the lease. But you've got other projects that are that you've been working on or nearer in time. That you're, that you're that you've spent more on you're trying to bring to fruition and so you got this lease sort of sitting out there these leases sort of sitting out there this project sort of sitting out there that you'll get to in due course so that's what that's what's happened with willow i mean they they you go through the exploration phase of you know doing export doing seismic and doing exploration drilling and then analyzing the exploration drilling then doing more exploration drilling because you if you find something you want to make sure you got enough of something there to justify the economics of doing it so it's it's been a it's been a fairly long process that they've gone through to get to to get to this stage. It's not it's not that they've been at it for thirty years and you know they've spent thirty years just sort of flailing along trying to get there. It's been the, it's been only the last few years that they've been in in significant development activities uh, with respect to with respect to this project. But you do come up at the end. I mean, you do come on. You do at some time it d does run out, and you need to be in first production by the by the time you hit the end of it. Well, it's interesting to see, uh, again, all the effort and time and energy that's been poured into this. And the fact, again, that, I mean, it was surprising. The Biden administration actually took a bunch of heat for approving the Willow Project. And so you'd think that, uh, you'd think that uh, uh, you know, with that kind of uh, approval, that it would be kind of a slam dunk. But I guess we'll have to see where it, I mean, where it well, goes there. 
Well, courts courts aren't supposed to bend to, to political uh, to political whims. So the fact that yeah, it, it's the thoroughness, I think, that the Biden administration put in on the review uh, that will be determinative. It's not it's not merely the fact that the Biden administration, the Biden administration of all administrations was the was the one that sided with it. It's the thoroughness that the Biden administration put into it. And I and I think the Biden administration did put did put a lot of effort into it. In some ways, in some ways, Trump did the industry a disservice. Trump by 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 rocket docketing these projects and you know giving them getting them through with the skimpiest of reviews, um, he sort of set them up for court review and court rejection. Right. And and in a way, sort of did the industry a disservice by by what he did. Biden has done the Biden administration has done it much more thoroughly, and I think is is much more ready. Uh, for court review than than the Trump administration did. So hopefully that will pay off. I mean, if if if, if what the Biden administration is, didn't do isn't good enough, nobody's going to be nobody's going to be renewing these leases, and nobody's going to be you know looking for additional leases out there. We may have some people still trying to pursue leases that they already have in hand, but uh, but it's going to be tough to justify. To, if Conoco gives up on this, it's going to be tough to justify to other investors why you're spending money on a project that even Conoco in Alaska with all of its Alaska reputation couldn't get done. It's a, uh, you investors are going to be very skeptical of somebody who says I can do it, but Conoco didn't, couldn't. Yeah, no, I mean, again, the fast tracking, it didn't do them any favors, I guess. And that's, that's the kind of the amorphousness of one administration to the other as the, as the position changes hands, things that, you know, they spend the first year undoing everything that their predecessor did that they didn't like. So it didn't really, uh, didn't really do them any favors in fast tracking all that stuff, but I guess we'll see what that means. And of course, as you said, it doesn't mean anything for like PICA that doesn't affect state lands, but there's still some significant opportunities out there, um, you know, for for other projects on the federal lands. If this goes through, if not, like you said, it takes a whole swath of properties off the table. Yeah, I, Conoco's identified additional opportunities beyond Willow. I mean, that's one of the reasons that the that the environmental community is so focused in on Willow because they see that as a step toward uh, additional development on federal land. So there are additional opportunities out there. This is this is sort of the uh, an additional Alpine, I think, was the first, but this is sort of additional steps out into NPRA that you want to see the the industry uh, pursuing. But yeah, if Conoco gives up, it's going to be hard to convince anybody else that uh, yeah. they somehow can do it better. Well, I think that's why they're fighting so hard right now is because they don't want any develop. You know, it's all lock it all up. They don't want to yeah. develop any of that federal land, and so they see the opportunity to stop it in its tracks if they can. Uh, fingers crossed that it doesn't uh, doesn't come down to that. Uh, all right, Brad. Uh, it's I know it's early in the week and it's been the weekend and everything else. What are you looking at for this next week? Quickly here. Well, I started working on the the column this week is going to be on inflation proofing. Um, the the permanent fund corporation issued its uh, 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 most recent July financial statements um, and really did really is doing some to me, weird stuff in the earnings reserve account. So, and it's, and it's tied to inflation proofing. So I'm focusing a lot on inflation proofing this coming week. All right. Well, we'll see what that brings uh, next week. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.